and welcome to the latest edition of the Leadership Untitled podcast, the show that likes to bring together experts from the world of L&D and or leadership, and hopefully give you guys some advice and tips and lessons to avoid the traps that we've all fallen into at some point. My guest this week is Graeme Shaw. Now, Graeme is a specialist in visual communication, conveying business ideas with quick sketches. Now, in his conferences, his audiences are often wowed by the fact that they too can draw on a talent they never knew they had. Famously, Graham has appeared on BBC television and radio and world news, as well as a bunch of other communications and publications. But perhaps most famously, it is his TED Talk from 2015 in Hull called Why People Believe They Can't Draw and How to Prove They Can that he's most famous for. This has been viewed just under 36 million times at point of recording and is the 12th most watched TED Talk on the online platform. He's recently followed that one up with a TEDx in Vienna talk called How to Draw to Remember More, both of which I'll give you the links to, well worth a watch. He's also an author of two books, The Art of Business Communication, and also his new book, uh, The Speaker's Coach, both of which, if you're on YouTube, you can see just behind me there on shoulder, and we'll link to those also. I genuinely can't wait to listen and chat with and to Graham. It's going to be a fantastic discussion all about unlocking potential, understanding from a leader's point of view how other ways you can communicate ideas, connect yourself and your people to those ideas, but also break down the barriers of these things, these limiting beliefs that we all hold about ourselves. And if you're looking on the uh, YouTube channel, then there's also a, a 10 or 15 minute bonus video for you where you too can learn to draw. Uh, without further ado then, let's welcome Graham to the show. Hi Graham, welcome to the Leadership Untitled podcast. How are you doing today? Yeah, very well. Thank you, Rob. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, it's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you have you on the show. And I kind of want to forewarn right from the start that the, the, uh, the audience that might be listening today um, is that uh, obviously this podcast goes out onto all the usual platforms and it's also available on YouTube. Um, it's one of those episodes that you might get just slightly more value if you see the video. Um, obviously, switch over now and again, at least, um, because it all will become clear very shortly why that is the case. Because um, I guess that what I like to normally do, Graham, is just to just to kind of say why it is I've approached my guests, because there's always a, a reason why I've invited someone on and see if they, they come along. Uh, and with yourself, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of watching uh, the TED Talks. Um, and, and, you know, quite a lot of the, the messaging and ideas I get through TED Talks over the years have, have, have kind of started to build what I think about things like leadership and, and, and business world and all that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, I came across yours um, because I was looking at the most viewed and uh, you are, and, and just correct me if I'm wrong, because I think I got it wrong the last time we spoke, but you were the, the 12th most watched TED talk ever. Well, I think that's right. Cause when you mentioned it, I looked it up and it was 12th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean that's 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 sub achievement. It's a fantastic achievement. So, like I say, I was I, I like to know what people are watching and thinking about, and, and, and what's in these things that's engaging people. And uh, we'll put a link to the video, obviously, in the show notes. But it's it's why people believe they can't draw. Um, and I thought, oh, this would be a little fun one to watch. And I was actually probably surprised by the depth of message I got from it, other than just being able to draw. Um, and so that's why I approached you. And I think, you know, I think the absolutely final nail for it for me, as I said to you, was that I think initially you said, you know, what do you think could contribute on the on the world of leadership to your podcast? And I'd only taken leadership messages from your video that was just outstanding. Um, so thank you for recording that video and bringing it into my life. <laughs> it's a pleasure, yeah. Um, so I guess um, what would be really useful for the audience then? Do you want to give a, a bit of a background to yourself and kind of like what, what it is you do, why you do it, and, and, and what culminated, I guess, into, into you uh, providing that TED Talk that now has just shy of 36 million views, can you believe? Well, it, yes, it's a, it's a bit of a long story, but I'll make it, just make it brief. Um, yeah, I mean, I work as a, a, a trainer uh, specializing in coaching people on um, communicating through sketching. So that's one aspect of what I do. So I run workshops for trainers and that sort of thing. I've written a book about the art of business communication, which is how we get ideas across with pictures. 
That's one aspect. And the other aspect is I coach a lot of people on speaking skills, whether one-to-one or in small groups, um, presentation skills, that sort of stuff. And that, that was the basis of the, the second book, um, The Speaker's Coach. Um, and, and how I sort of got to that really is uh, I actually started as a primary school teacher and uh, I was a primary school teacher for about 14 years and uh, you know, love working with children. And uh, then worked at British Airways as a training manager, also in learning and development. And it was there that I began to sometimes sketch ideas if I was running a management development program, a leadership model or something like that. And then one day, once I'd left British Airways and I was working on my own as a consultant, which I've done for a long time, somebody asked me if I could teach the skills of sketching to, uh, to others. And this was 15 or more years ago. Yeah. So I ran a, a free sort of workshop on it. And they liked it and um, took a bit of good fortune. Somebody from HSBC Bank was there and asked me if I could teach these skills to trainers. So I ended up designing a, a, a um, well, I went and did a 40 minute talk and uh, they said to me, uh, oh, could you do a, they liked it. So could you do a whole day? Uh, I was at this conference and I thought, well, I don't know if you've had the feeling, Rob, of when you've only got 40 <laughs> minutes worth of material. <laughs> I thought, how could I spin this out for a day? But I did design a whole one day workshop on it. Um, called Cartooning for Trainers, and, um, and that, that sort of started. And um, so I, that, those sorts of things kept running with lots of companies for years, in-house programs. But then one day, uh, there was a lady who attended uh, an open program and saw me doing this, um, a lady called Helen Bissett. And she, Helen saw me and, uh, and said, uh, I'm one of the organisers of TEDx Hull, and I wonder if you could come to that. So when I went to that, uh, or prior to that, I was thinking, you know, what, what could I do? And there was a bit of advice from, uh, a bit of written advice from Ted, which was, um, make this the talk of your life. Uh, that no put, pressure then. <laughs> that's, I thought, oh God, and it's not just any old talk, you know. What could I do? And I thought back as to the things that I could do that, that people had found the most helpful. And one of the things that repeatedly was the, the way that I began to teach people the cartoon drawing. Um, the first few minutes, seemed to really surprise people in how well they did. And I thought, okay, if I could replicate that in this TED talk, how would that be? That would be great. And also have the bigger message that um, what I noticed impressing people when I was just teaching them drawing, I noticed what they were getting out of it quite often was, oh, a a real, um, almost like a belief shift because they'd suddenly go, oh, wow, I didn't think I could draw anything. And now I've drawn a little cartoon that looks not bad. Mm-hmm. So the big message out of the, the TEDx Hull talk, which to be fair, people did get the message was that, you know, if you didn't think you can draw and now you've found that you can at least learn, um, you know, what else can you do that you hitherto didn't believe you could do? And I know speaking to you, Rob, you learned to do the Rubik's Cube, which I wouldn't have a clue how to do, <laughs> but that, that's a similar example. So it's about, it was about shifting belief, really. Uh, yeah. that talk and that's how I came to that and I've always had an interest in sketching and I've always had an interest in, in, in speaking skills so yeah slightly long answer but that's the story oh great answer it's, it's, it's a great story um, and yeah you mentioned the, the the Rubik's Cube and again if you're on the YouTube you, you can you see there <laughs> there it is pointed uh, the, um, and I think what that was that was really a connection I had with your video because probably because of that I see it's almost it almost becomes a metaphor for being able to do other things yeah. um it's quite interesting now that i mean uh, the, some of the people listening to this have probably seen my videos on the rubik's cube and, and how i learned it but, <laughs> um breaking it down to smaller chunks learning one bit over and over again until i got it not trying to jump to the completion point and getting frustrated and then boom, boom, boom eventually and now i can do it under three minutes without thinking about anything really <laughs> it's it, it, it's brilliant um but little things for me like i now have a uh, when I post stuff on social media, I've got a presentation template that I keep and all my sort of kind of Instagram posts are in there, perfectly square um, template. Um, and it's actually called Rubik's Cube, the filers, because it always, I always think, well, this is where the inspiration's got to come from. What can I put out there that can try to maybe change the way people think about stuff? Yeah. So it's a constant inspiration. Um, but like many people in your audience on the, on the TED Talk, I was kind of raising my hand going, you know, I, I know I can't draw though, despite having learned the, the Rubik's Cube, having said I'll never be able to do that at 40 years old. And then I did it within a, within a month. Um, I can't draw, but the response you had was fantastic. So 
just talk to me a bit more about just how phenomenally successful that's been. And I guess the, the reward you get from just changing those perspectives that people have about themselves, those beliefs. Well, it, it, yes. It, I mean, it, I suppose it, it has been, it has been very successful. Surprisingly. I mean, I, when it first started and I got sort of a few thousand views, I thought it was staggering. And when it was 40,000 views, I, you know, thought that was amazing and I couldn't believe how popular it might be, but how that's how that's um i've been rewarded by it really is is the satisfaction of um you know people writing to me or asking me to do things uh, on the basis of that um and i mentioned to you that um you know i did i've done some work with people who've had uh strokes i mentioned that in the video actually um who've got a condition called aphasia mm. and and i've locally i've done some sessions with them um and in lockdown some some you know online sending some video um on, on on sketching and that just sort of helps their confidence and that the feedback from that was really nice really nice and i've done been doing that since probably about 2013 now mm. um but also um you know i did in lockdown i did a few sessions for a, a charity in dorset um who who um called my time actually who um look after young carers these are children aged five upwards and it was wonderful to be doing a bit of drawing with them online uh, as an activity to to stimulate them and improve their um, sense of you know self esteem that sort of thing. So I think one of the biggest rewards has been that. And you know people write occasionally you know, people write to me and they've got a photograph of their fridge where the child has drawn something and they put it up <laughs> yeah. on the fridge. You know, so th it's really nice when people kind of come back to you and say I saw that and I really appreciated it. I think it's, it's, it's crucial messaging as well that, you know, what, what something else that I took from your video, it was, you know, it's, it's not, and this is the trap that L&D, you'll be no stranger to this kind of fall into, of being able to do something great and therefore just telling people that it's great and then maybe showing them to do it so they can do it. And then that's where it all kind of stops. Um, but the effect that you were having, yeah, absolutely. I think particularly the, the story you told in the TED Talk about the, uh, about the stroke recoverers. Yes, was 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 particularly powerful because this is something that this isn't just a case of you know drawing something and just getting a little bit of a laugh off a kid or something like that this was making genuine changes and improvements and just happiness and also throwing up a few surprises for you in their lives as anyone just want to kind of retell that to us yes well I, I mean i was amazed when i was first asked i was at a party uh it was 2013 and Somebody asked me what I did, um, <laughs> like they do, and then you, I, I never know quite what answer to give, you know, the, oh, I'm a trainer and that's it or what. Anyway, <laughs> and she said to me, oh, um, I'm involved in this group that um, do activities for people who've had strokes, recovering from strokes, and I particularly got aphasia, which is a condition that about a third of people who've had strokes have got this condition, which um, impairs their ability either to understand or communicate or something like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I was, I, could you come and do something for them? And I was full of trepidation. And when I went along, because I've worked with adults, I've worked with children, but I'd never worked with people like this. And I thought, you know, my wife said, do your cartooning with them, you know? And I thought, will, will they be able to do it? Will I be able to explain it? Will it be a total disaster? But they really liked it. And um, there were 18 roughly of them there and each had a helper. So there were about 36 people there, I suppose, if you double that. And um, yeah, and, and there, was a, there was a doctor there who happened to be the chairman of this charity called Talk. And um, he, he took lots of pictures and they loved it. So they said to me, can you talk? We've got four other groups. Can you go around to them now? Brilliant. So I did. And um, but it was wonderful. Even mo many people who've had a stroke, uh, for example, if they've had a stroke on one side, they lose their ability on the other side of their body. You probably know that. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them were drawing with their left hand instead of their right hand um, and still managing to draw. Yeah. Um, so it, it was it was actually quite humbling. I was I kind of came out probably gaining more than they did in terms of what I, you know, gained as, as a reward from that. Yeah. Uh, and it did lead to other things. I mean, for the, the TEDx uh, whole talk, um, fortunately, I was contacted by the University of by Boston University and um, they actually run it. They've got an aphasia research center. Wow. And, um, they wrote to me to say that just wanted me to know that a student had spotted me on the TEDx talk and um, they'd been using the video with their recoverers there, stroke recoverers, and uh, who'd got aphasia. And they wondered if I'd be interested in doing something with them. And um, 
we, we had a chat sort of back and forth. And in the end, I went over and did, um, did a, a workshop with, with them uh, oh, in, in Boston, yeah, which was really, really great. So um, it was a really nice thing to do. Mom, I said to my wife, to fancy a holiday, we'll go over there. And, um, <laughs> and they, re they really looked after me. It was really nice. So that, that was, you know, so other things sprung up, really. So, yeah. That's brilliant. I mean, the, 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 the thing that I took as well from the, the TED Talk is that you said it was um, it, on that story as it, in particular was that you didn't actually know that no one told you they were going to be using the, the wrong hands. And and that was something you found out afterwards. And I just thought, was, yeah. I sort of bundle all this together about these limited beliefs. It's like, know. you know, in, your, in the start of your TED Talk, you're talking about people who just think they can't draw. Yes. There you're talking about people who haven't even flagged that to you. And yeah. they're having a go, having been a stroke victim and on the road to recovery. And they're just yeah. doing it with their left hand. There's no complaining about it they're just having no. a crack and they're all achieving it and enjoying it and having a great time with it yes it, it, it's absolutely completely and utterly humbling rob um i always come out of there uplifted you know i i, I get all the praise because i turn up and i do an hour with these folks or an hour and a half and you know everybody says thank you very much for giving you time and all of that but i actually go out more inspired having done it uh, because these these people are the real stars, you know. Um, they are absolutely incredible. Their ability to have a go without complaining about anything, and believe me, they've they've got a lot to complain about if they wanted to. Um, so, it, it, yeah, staggering, really. But you know, this part part of the message that actually bringing this into kind of the the leadership side of things again is that in the coaching that I do and the, the workshops that I do, a big part of that is about leading yourself before you lead others. Um, and just just with the way you said there, the reward that you get from it, um, that's a massive part of it. If you can yeah. walk away in what you do and that gives you energy, actually yes. just, just really gives you those boosts and you're making a real difference and, you, and you're connected to a, a genuine purpose that excites you and makes a difference, you're going to love what you do. Yeah. Absolutely love what you do. And you're probably <laughs> going to do it better and you're probably going to impact more people through that. Well, that's right. There's, there's a, there's, it's like almost like a circle, isn't it? It's, if you have got enjoyment at the top, enjoy what you do. You, you do more of it. If you do more of it, you get better at it. If you, you know, it kind of goes around like that. Um, yeah. I, I, I saw that somewhere uh, years ago. I can't remember where, but uh, yes, it's a, it's a kind unless of it's cycle. Gone. Unless it's gone. <laughs> unless, unless it's gone. Yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I got better at it, than I didn't enjoy it as much anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, a big, a big I guess the, the theme of, of that talk, and I think, you know, bringing it into the, this world of kind of self-leadership, self-understanding, and then leadership of others as well, um, is this whole bit about limited beliefs. Because, I mean, long story short, and obviously I'll encourage all the, all the guys listening to go and go away and have a, uh, have, a, have a watch of the TED Talk. And also, I think at the end of, the, um, at the end of this podcast, we'll also do a, a short extra for the, uh, the YouTube channel as well, where people can have a yeah. go at this. <laughs> but most people on there, well, everyone I was looking at in the audience seemed genuinely surprised at what they, were, what they learned in what was only a you know, typically sort of 15, 16 minute talk yeah um, and it but it is a it, that is a great example just like the rubik's cube of a, of a genuine belief that people will go i can't do that and i'll never be able to do that and sometimes it's they put it down to it's just a natural talent i don't have that talent that person does i don't yeah is that something that kind of you, you've looked at in the past because you mentioned teaching as well obviously in your history is, yes is, is the is the drawing and that come together to 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 play a bigger part well, yeah, I mean, I used to use the drawing in, in teaching um, when I was taking assemblies in, in primary school. I, I'm old enough to, or you may be, you may not be, uh, uh, Rob, I'm old enough to remember um, at the overhead projector oh, yeah. and um, the acetate that you could roll along, you know, <laughs> and you'd have these coloured pens that if you got them on your hand, it was the right mess. <laughs> and I would I would sit on the stage in, in school and tell a story, it might be a Bible story, it might be just a, any story, really. Um, and um, and and draw a picture on the acetate and then then wind it on and you know draw the next picture and um that's that that's how i used it in in schools and sometimes in the classroom obviously um but um but yeah i mean primary school teaching is full of um full of uh surprising beliefs because um children always often surprise you about what they can they can do um 
I once, when I was teaching um, what, what in those days might be called craft design and technology, but just in, in my own classroom with my own 10 and 11 year olds, um, I set them the task once. I gave them a lot of materials like, um, you know, cornflake packets and all this sort of stuff. And they had, we were doing um, bridges as a topic and they had to make out of cardboard a bridge. And I got a brick and I said, if you can make a bridge uh, that you can, in your little groups that you, I can put a brick on and it won't collapse, then, you know, that is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we had a little cloakroom right next to the classroom and some of the girls were working in the cloakroom and eventually they came and said, oh, we finished, Mr. Shaw, you know. Oh yeah. And I said, well, yeah, yeah. you know, will, the brick, will it hold the brick? this bridge you've made out of cardboard and stuff. And they said, we can stand on it. Wow. <laughs> so I thought, well, what have they done here? Because <laughs> so, I thought I was- All saying, of them, oh, all of them at the same time. time. Well, one, one, no, just one could stand on it. I thought, what, what, have, they, what have they done here? You know, because um, I thought I was setting a big challenge with the brick. Yeah. Anyway, they came back into the classroom. What they'd done was they got six toilet rolls because they've got plenty of toilet rolls. They put them all in, next uh, upright next to each other and put tape around them so imagine six rolls upright now yeah tubes yeah. upright bound together so it's just about that shape and then they put card on the top and card on the bottom and fixed that on and then they made that look like a road you know like a bridge it was about this big and then one of them could get one foot on it and they, they put the foot on it and just sort of bounced a bit on top of it and because the six toilet rolls were vertical it, they, they were very strong and they were bound together. And so this girl could actually stand on them. So Brilliant. that was an example of, um, of, of breaking my limiting beliefs about what they could do. Well, that's it. And I think, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's, a, well, it's a really, really good coaching technique that I've used in the past and, and facilitation technique of, of people going out there, really pushing people to think of the wacky, creative, you know, yeah. almost almost as far as, you know, go crazy to something that, that probably wouldn't work and you'd never be able to afford to build or whatever it might be, but would solve the problem. What would it be? And yes. working back from that place of, just sheer creativity will yeah. normally then lead to you coming up with something that, that can work and is still creative. But unless you let that creativity in, in the first place, you, you'll probably just end up playing it safe and sticking to process. <laughs> well, that's right. I, it was, I don't know. It, it, it was apparently Albert Einstein who said uh, something that you never know if these things are quite true. And it, I, I'm probably paraphrasing it. But apparently when asked something to do with, um, what uh, coming up with you know how do you come up with innovative or creative ideas um he was reputed to have said something like um if an idea um at first doesn't sound completely absurd there's probably no hope for it <laughs> I like that. I like that uh, a lot. <laughs> probably no hope for it as as a new innovative idea of value you know if it, it because otherwise it's if it sounds too kind of sensible it's probably a bit like what we're doing you know well, I can remember years years ago I was I ran a session when I was uh, when I was working at, at Sky, it was, and I was uh, running it with a team whose job it was to essentially trying to find out what problems were existing on the site, and then they would help uh, leaders try to solve those problems. So it was it was essentially a problem solving session, uh, for want of a better word, and one of the biggest problems on that site was car parking, uh, i.e. there was none. Um, and it was uh, it was next to a bus station. It was next to a train station, but still, cars were a problem. Um, but the same old things would come up, like there's no spaces, and uh, it costs too much to park there. Uh, it's not safe. All this sort of stuff. And when run those sessions, I'd encourage this. I'd, I'd actually start them off and say, "Well, what we'll do is instead of just asking for a car park and all this sort of stuff, let's uh, let's say we were going to uh, we we're going to build a monorail that goes around Stockport." Um, or maybe charter individual helicopters for each of you, <laughs> or things like this. And you know, would it get rid of all these problems and all the symptoms of the problems? And every time it'd be, yeah, it gets rid of them all, gets rid of them all, gets rid of them all. Right, okay, so why don't we do it? Oh, that one's just ridiculous. That's just ridiculous. And I'm going, well, you, you sound like the managers you're complaining about now, saying that they say no to all your great ideas that would solve all the problems. Um, but working back from that then, people came up with some really good ideas yeah. that they hadn't thought of before because they just got, I guess, stuck in this self-limiting mm. belief again of I can't draw, I can't do the Rubik's Cube, we can't have car parks, whatever it might be. <laughs> but then they thought differently about it, approached it differently. So I guess, you know, from, from that point of view, moving on from kind of the, the, the kind of the, the, the children that we've talked about there, leadership of this sort of stuff is, is 
is massively important because I've I've kind of seen you as adopted almost that role of leader. That's why I've approached you in that video, the things you were doing, the things you've achieved through it, uh, the things you've done on the back of that video, before it and after it. What what how can leaders really begin to embrace what it is that that you're putting out there? Because really, honest, some people will probably be listening to this going, so what you're saying, Rob, that leaders should start drawing? What, <laughs> what, what's going on? <clears throat> Well, I think um, if, if we think about um, one of the key things of, of being a leader, in my view, is the ability to communicate with others and you know, help people understand what the vision is, like help people to develop a vision, perhaps. Yep. Um, so communication is key. Um, and, and obviously, the, the one aspect that I attempt to help people with in that respect is the actual speaking skills. Um, which is all about things like, you know, how you stand, you know, if you're leaning one way or leaning the other. These are all sending different messages. You know, if we want to come across as really credible and serious, you know, it's no good sort of wobbling about all the time or leaning around on one foot. So that's... Absolutely long- become very conscious of how I'm sitting now. And yeah. The YouTube so audience. So <laughs> one, and how we're using our voice, that sort of thing. That's one whole aspect um, that, that could really make a difference to how people perceive a leader. Um, because, you know, a good leader needs to be, in my view, needs to have credibility, authority, that kind of thing, but also needs to be approachable and um, be able to engage people. Um, so, you know, there's all those sorts of skills. Um, in terms of the drawing skills, again, uh, in terms of presenting, apart from the speaking skills, the actual sketching skills can, can work really nicely with with. Uh, being a leader and explaining things to groups or engaging them uh, in, in, um, in working together. So, for example, um, you know, you quite often have, um, let's, say, let's say you've got um, um, something to explain to people. Sometimes instead of just um, showing a slide or whatever, I mean, I'm not against PowerPoint. You can do some great things with PowerPoint, but instead of sometimes just showing a slide, um, you know, you, you could sketch something yourself. And the good news is it doesn't have to be fantastic, but there's an important thing. The, the picture doesn't have to be fantastic, but the important thing is that something happens the moment, if you're in an office and you make a mark on a whiteboard or a flip chart, something happens in the room. So for example, if I were to do that now on this flip chart, you can see something on there. Mm. So what's going on now as I'm looking at this is you're probably wondering, or viewers might be wondering what it is. For those listening, I've just drawn a little shape on a flip chart. Yep. What we've got there is an open loop because I've now opened a loop because I've drawn something, but I haven't finished it yet. See, I'm sorry, I think, you know, is it, it could be a horseshoe. Um, right. it, it's like a, a letter U on its side, I'm, I'm guessing. You don't, you don't know. Yeah. So this is ever so simple, but the idea of speaking to people and opening a loop where you haven't finished it, the brain loves, of course, to close loops. So all the time that I'm speaking to you now, and this is still not finished, you're wondering what it is. That's a very, very good state for learning. Mm. Because when I begin to draw a bit more on it, you, you start to notice what it could be. You might be thinking, is it my character Spike? I've just drawn some eyes on there for those listening. It looks like a nose and eyes now. Yep. But, but then I might draw something else on there like this. And you're thinking, oh, well, that's not Spike. And if I drew that, you think, oh, yeah, that's Albert Einstein. You know, so... Just following, following the lines is very powerful because, because it keeps you hooked. Mm. So when you're a manager or a leader telling a story or explaining a, a, an idea, to draw something as you go along grips attention. And the, 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 the important thing is that the standard of the drawing, while it's nice if you can draw something like this, uh, it, you know, and, and you can learn that. If people could watch the TEDx talk at Hull and would learn how to do this because this is on there. Yep. But even if, Rob, you just wanted to explain a graph, so you might decide, or, or a model, you know, you might, for example, talk about um, a vision. Mm. So you might want to say, um, okay, we, we are on a, we're on a journey, okay, and, and we want to get to here. For those listening, I'm drawing a, a little person on the top of a mountain waving a flag. Yep, a little, a little Everest climber there. That's, the That's right, and I might put a, a little note that says we are here and draw a few little stick figures so again for those listening i've drawn on the right hand side i've got a mountain on the left hand side i've got a group of people okay yep. we are here 
And, you know, you could be speaking to your team and saying, you know, there are a number of hurdles to get over. I'm drawing some hurdles here in order to get to the, the goal that we want. Yeah. And, and today what I'd like to do with you is to explore what are the three key hurdles that we would need to get over, you know. Now, so that's just a little drawing, but hopefully it, it engages you while I'm explaining it. Absolutely. Um, and I'm, it's actually bringing to life the fact that the term that we use, bigger picture as well. I, yeah. I can see the bigger picture and I can see it being kind of chunked down in there. Um, and, you know, something we mentioned when we chatted the other day is, you know, if you compare this to something like, I don't know, we, we're still, where are we now? Middle of uh, 8th of July. We're still in the midst of uh, Boris Johnson and his uh, and his comedy duo either side of him, his bookends, as I like to call them, um, giving us graphs every day, uh, latest yeah. figures. And when those graphs come up, I don't know if you're anything like me, but <laughs> you kinda, you, you're trying to process the graph while you're trying to listen to them. There's that much on there. There's yes. probably a bunch of valuable information. What am I going, well, what, what dates it start from? Where's it ending? Where are we now? Uh, where am I? Is this by region? I have no idea. And I'm, I'm probably missing them explaining it. Yeah. But what you're talking about there, and I guess you, you, you've mentioned PowerPoint in terms of the ability potentially to, to animate it in that way, yeah. but also in terms of drawing it then, you'd be able to do the exact same thing. If they were drawing that and you just like focus the attention on one part at a time, Yeah. but then the, the ability then to build that towards the bigger picture as well, yes. it seems like a very, well, an obvious thing, an obvious improvement to engage your people and communicate with them so they're actually going to understand what it is you're trying to get across to them. Well, that's right. And you can, of course, you can draw. Gra graph would be a great example to draw. And again, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to draw the graph in its com whole complexity, but the nice thing about having a pen uh, is being, being able to just draw the, the matters. So the moment you draw two axes like that, people think, oh, is that going to be a graph? Okay. Yep. And the moment I put something like zero down here and 100 up here, you're wondering what it's going to be. You know, and I might put an M on the end and a, a pound sign. Oh, it's it's money, you know. And then if I put 2021 across here, it's time. And then I might put some crosses on here and talk about, you know, the different amount of revenue at different times going up and down and start to do arrows on it. For those listening, I've drawn a vertical and horizontal axis uh, with 100 million pounds up the left side and 2021 across the, the bottom. And then just drawn some arrows going up and down and some, some crosses. Um, to, to, you know to mark the information and what's lovely is with um with your pen you know you can say you know the bit that i'm really interested in is this bit or you can draw a red circle as i have around one part of it and it's very easy to engage people in that because what you're doing is it, it, it's what i call the magic of live drawing mm. and it's very underused but but as you look at this now what you realize is that that they're only really simple lines and, and you could use really simple symbols uh, and, and it still works. It still works very well. So, uh, you know, the little symbols that I've got, uh, those of you who are watching on YouTube can see I've got a tree, which might represent growth here on a different, on, the, on my uh, flip chart at the front, a mountain leadership, uh, a ship might represent adventure. Yeah. These are little things that you can, you can sketch. Um, but yes, I think a lot of tricks are missed on how we show graphs in PowerPoint uh, as well. And um, that, that's that's another little topic to talk about. <laughs> well, it's, 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 what I like is that it's the live nature of, the, of this stuff. Um, uh, you know, and again, it goes back to the success of the TED Talk, I, I, I think really, is that it was live. It had people in the audience obviously listening to what you were doing but participating in it and building it up with you yes um, culminating not just in being able to draw one picture but actually learning a series of techniques that meant they could do loads and loads of things and you know I, i've heard you say on a few videos that you just mentioned there about learning certain things that can mean different things like the tree could mean life could mean growth whatever it yes. might be um, and I think you know, things like I think PowerPoint now one of the most um, uh, successful features in it is actually the icon range in the yes. sort of later versions because they're just yes. very simple graphics yes. like a tree or a clock or a car yeah. or whatever it might be. Yeah. And, but this is again just adding that I think well one of the what I've seen a lot of over the last I would say five to ten years are those animated videos that yes. kind of uh, yes. not necessarily actually being hand drawn mm. they are uh, computer generated quite often but it's the same sort of principle yes and if you and if people listening to this kind of think to themselves 
you know, would that live drawing thing, a manager, is that going to work? Is that going to engage my team? They're probably all at the same time going to go, oh, I know those sort of videos you're on about, Rob. They're really engaging them because they build yeah. and they're answering their own question. Yes, uh, absolutely. And, and these, obviously, it takes a bit of practice. Um, you know, it, people can't necessarily jump straight into doing this sort of thing. But once, once people get the hang of it, it'll work very well. I've got here, I'll just, for those who are watching on... Um, on the video, so I've got a board here with um, with a, a diagram on as an example. There we can see mm -hmm. this one. Sometimes I use when I'm doing some of my workshops online. You can see here this is a shape of a mind map, mm. and what what it's doing here for those who who can't actually see it who are listening, it, it says roles in the middle, like roles in, a, in a, a, your job roles, as it were, and it's got four headings like a mind map: communications, products, marketing, and finance. And it's got branches off the end of that. And really what it's, what it's showing, Rob, is, is by these little pictures, it's got a picture of a factory, picture of products, picture of the world to represent global, mm -hmm. um, picture of a bag of money. And um, this is the sort of thing that if you were explaining to something to a group, you could start with a blank sheet and, and just sketch that. And you would have that magic of something unfolding, like the story unfolding. Mm. Which would be very different from if you just showed this as a complete PowerPoint slide to start with. Oh, of course, you could, you could do it as a PowerPoint slide and bring one bit up at a time. That would have a very similar effect. Mm. So, but the actual act of writing or drawing on a whiteboard, um, you know, works very well. And um, in terms of memory, um, I'm going to flip this over and there's a mind map on the back. Um, and so, again, for those of you who are listening rather than watching, I'm showing a mind map now with, with um, you, you're familiar with a mind map where, where it, it starts in the center and you've got the arms coming out and it says vitamins on here. And uh, yeah. it shows vitamin, the arms on the mind map show vitamin A, B1, B2, C and D. D down the bottom. I seem to have forgot to label D. I need to write a D down there. There we go. Let's put that, um, let's put a D down here. Mm -hmm. Vitamin D. And basically, the reason for showing you that is that um, uh, it, it is, is, is that as a demonstration of the power of pictures, I have many times drawn that in front of a group, having firstly shown them the same information on a piece of paper, which I'll hold up for people who can see this. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's actually information about nutrition and vitamins from the GCSE, well, a GCSE revision manual in England and Wales but I've drawn it into a picture. Now, if I draw that from a blank, I can draw it in about probably eight minutes or so. And children watching it or adults watching it, if I then put it away, put it down and, and give, hold up a blank, they can tell me pretty much where everything is on that, that picture. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I, I can get them to recreate it themselves on a piece of paper. So they create something a bit like that that I'm holding up now. Um, and amazingly, they normally surprise themselves because they get most of it right. Not everybody gets everything right, but especially if you put people in twos working together, they can recreate that. And one of the reasons is that um, the brain can remember spatially where things are. Mm -hmm. So on a page, if I draw a carrot on the left and a fish on the right, and I later ask people which side was the fish, they say, oh yeah, the fish was over on the right hand side. Um, and also it's organized hierarchically. So you've got on a mind map, people will be familiar, you've got the big lines and then the smaller lines at the end. Um, so because it's organized and because it's visual, it's easy to remember. So again, that's something that, you know, coming back to leaders, you could be explaining something and draw it as a map. Um, yeah. uh, the, the other key point about leaders I was going to mention was getting people collaborating and drawing. So for example, on here, creating storyboards. So for those listening, I've, I've shown, I'm, I'm showing a flip chart with um, what could be if you were in a room. And um, are you familiar with those facilitation boards, Rob? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Boards that you get, fantastic things in a room. And they've got, you can put brown paper on them normally that, that has a bit of a stickiness to it. You can spray on it. Uh, that's a bit like a post-it note stickiness. And then you get these cards about the size of an envelope, you know, that, that you can write things on and stick them on. Yep. And you can peel them off and move them about, which is very flexible. Um, but again, normally what people do is they simply write a word, don't they? You know, if you should come up with ideas to share with your team. But in this yeah. instance, if you, if you just say to people, when you write a word, you must draw a little symbol 
or a picture, people will do it, even if it's not a very particularly clever one. <clears throat> so, for example, here, if they're talking about briefings, there are some little pictures of people here. If they're talking about research, they've got a couple of bits of paper with bullet points on. Um, if they're talking about um, uh, a journey, they've got a little road over here. Can, can you see that well enough, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, and you might think, well, yeah, but what's the point of that? Why don't they just write, write the words? But you know, if you just write the words, they all look pretty similar. But when you draw pictures, people can literally see what you mean. Mm -hmm. um, so again, if you wanted a group to work on a whiteboard to, to develop a, 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 a journey, uh, a project, if you made a simple rule that said, every time you write a word, you must draw a little symbol to represent it, it would be so much easier to, to follow. Mm. And it's, a, it's a little bit like those, uh, that experiment you see quite a lot when people write a, a name of a, a colour down, but in, in the colour of another colour. Yes. You, you, you see the colour first, not the word, I guess, because you, you, your mind's seeing that and registering that first. I think, you know, you, you, think, some, you think of some things like, even from like as kids, you would play things like matching cards, matching pairs, or uh, people of a, a certain age, and, and the listeners might remember the generation game. Yes. The conveyor belt at the end, and, <laughs> and you remember. If you just had a list of words, it'd be much more difficult to remember all of the things that were on that list. That's right. Um, than it would be to kind of go past and go. It's a cuddly toy. It's a television. It's a well, microwave. <laughs> I, I tell you what. What's what's really interesting is that, in, and and people watching and listening could probably identify with this because many of those listening, you will have done examinations at school, that sort of thing, and you may well have used mind maps. You may have drawn little pictures. Or, you know, you can remember sometimes perhaps sitting in, exa in an exam and, and trying to remember something and you can actually picture the page of the book with the diagram on it. And that's all coming back to mind. So really to use the power of pictures and memory is amazing. And um, mm. in, the, in the TEDx talk I did in Vienna, which is called um, How to Draw to Remember More. So that's the, the second one I did, How to Draw to Remember More. I mentioned a, a study at the University of Waterloo in Canada, and um, that was in about 2016, they, they did it. And um, what, what they did, one part of the study, was to, to see how well people could remember lists of words. Mm -hmm. Basically, they, they'd give them lists of words, um, and they had different ways of remembering them that they were given. Um, and they usually had about 40 seconds to try and remember each word, and then uh, so, and they gave that they could actually write the word down, um, but sometimes they were allowed to draw the word as well as write it. And so they might draw something like, um, say the word was balloon. Uh, again, for those of you just uh, listening to this, I'm, I'm writing the word balloon on a flip chart here. And there's the balloon. And they got them to draw something, you know, a simple picture. Yeah. And it didn't matter if it wasn't a fantastic picture. What they did was they, after a while, they then stopped people doing that and they played um, played some music and a, a distraction, gave them a distraction task with some music. And then they gave them a test to try and remember the words. On average, um, when people were allowed to draw the word, they remembered double the amount of words in the test compared with when they wrote them, just wrote them down. And that was just by drawing a very quick squiggle of a picture. And the other thing was, what they found was the quality of the pictures made no difference to how well people remembered it. So even what you might call a, a poor picture still worked. Well, I think that's genuinely, well, one of the things that I mentioned to you the other day when we chatted was I'm, I'm a, a big believer in um, simple, natural speech in terms of tone of voice, the words that we choose, why do we choose more complicated words when we're in an office environment to try and appear <laughs> smarter than we are, whatever it might be. I, I, what I really love about that story is that, that the quality of the image didn't seem to make a difference no. because and it goes back to the other diagram you studied before around um, making the drawing to match the word. Yeah. You know, if, we, if we could only choose words in the workplace that we could think we could draw a picture to associate with it, it might yes. eliminate a lot of these silly phrases and silly words that we <laughs> use. You know, I can't draw that, but I can draw this. So I'll use yeah, a similar yeah. word. Yeah. But I think that's I, I think that's a really key part of this is that making the communication you use really simple and clear. And yes. memorable yes. and communication in so many circles is talked about for, oh, 
forever, obviously, but I think particularly over the last sort of five, 10 years again, of with so many teams and so many even communications teams, let alone other teams in an organization, make the mistake of thinking the communication is done as soon as you've pressed send. Yeah. Uh, and it isn't. It's about how's that registered? How's that been understood at the other end? Has it been understood? Are there any questions? Mm. And if something like this can help that, and what I find particularly useful, you know, we've made the comparison a few times to say, you know, there's drawing and, and PowerPoint can do some of it. I see one big distinction is that, and this is just based on experience, whether it's been me presenting or whether I've seen other people doing it. If you watch your TED Talk and people watching on the YouTube uh, channel now, uh, watch uh, watching what you're doing, they're engaging with you and the picture. Mm. You are as one with the picture as you're mm. drawing it. They're very much listening to you tell the story through the images you're creating at the same time. Whereas you look at other TED Talks even, but uh, the use of PowerPoint tends to then distance the, ste- the, the speaker from what's being shown. Mm. Typically on a TED Talk, what you'll see is that people will point up towards the screen. Mm. Uh, if, you're watching it on, uh, if you're watching it on the computer, you'll normally see that the slide comes up on the screen and the speaker's now gone. So yes. you're not, they're not associated. Um, and again, with, with, I guess, in business, it could be over, over Teams or Zoom, or it could be, again, separated onto a TV screen. Yeah. Whereas I find what you're doing is it's a lot more personal. You are owning it. You're not disassociating yourself with it. And people aren't just following the message. They're, they're, they're actually starting to build a relationship with you on that as that's well. That's right. Yeah, so that's right. So you, 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 you kind of work with the drawing as you're doing it. And it's about knowing when to look at the audience and when to look at the drawing. You know, and a, a simple little tip is people will always look where you look. You know, so if I look across at this picture of the balloon that I've got, and there was a live audience in the room, they'd be looking at it with me. And the moment I turn back to you, Rob, or back to the audience and look, then they look back at my eyes, you know. So yeah. it's, it's, it's those skills of, of doing that. Um, and incidentally, you mentioned about using PowerPoint. I mean, uh, I think PowerPoint's a fantastic thing. If, if you're using um, predominantly pictures uh, or graphics and you're making it varied, mm. there's nothing wrong with having some bullet points now and then, and also nothing wrong with just having words on the screen. If you've got a very powerful phrase you want people to remember, a message, just having that written on the screen is, is very, very um, valuable. Um, but too often what happens, in my view, is there's too much information on um, slides. Yeah. And often people will say to me, well, that, that's because they need all the information. But of course, they don't need everything on the slide when you're there to explain it. Mm. Um, it you know, it's important just to put the key points on the slide. And if you really wanted them to have a lot more detail, then in your conference audience or your, your group at work, you can actually give them a more detailed slide subsequently. Mm. Um, but people often clutter them up. And the other thing is about creating the anticipation to see a slide. So, you know, if, if for example, um, I'll just do a little example here. What often people do is they just, they just press the button, you know, um, and it comes up. And the moment, if you press the button and a slide comes up, often what's happening is the moment it comes up, people are trying to interpret it. You know, so I'll, I'll give you an example, this little one that I drew earlier on, um, if I can find it again. Uh, I, drew a, I drew a little graph, didn't I, with some X's on it. Yeah. Okay. Let's see if I can see. I've got in my mind at the moment, Graham. I've got I've got weather presenters uh, pointing towards the clouds in the different parts of the country. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah, they do. They do that. Um, so okay, let's just have a little look. Okay, there we are. Look. That little graph I draw for those uh, just listening. I'm showing the graph now that had the vertical and the horizontal axis with an X marked with a red spot. You know. So often when people are present, let's imagine now, this isn't a, a drawing, but let's imagine it's a PowerPoint slide. Mm. So it's a really nice, because there's nothing wrong with having graphs on slides work fantastically, but it's about how you interact with them to make them engaging. So what will typically happen is people are, in my opinion, in my experience, a bit slipshod and slapdash about when they press the button to show the slide. <laughs> yeah. So what, what often happens is this, so let's say I've been talking about something already and now I'm going to move on to show this graph. So what happens often is I'm just finishing talking about this bit. I press the button, the graph's coming up now. And I say to you, right, now I'm going to talk to you about our performance. And I've already got the graph up with performance. Yeah. Okay. Now, what are the audience doing already? 
<laughs> they're trying to figure out what the graph says and what you're about to tell them about it based that's on that's right so you've got you've got some people looking over here you've got some people wondering what the red bit is you've got other people looking down here so you know lots of things are happening yeah. and if it, it had it been bullet points you've got people already reading them yeah uh and again in my in my um speaker's coach book i mentioned a study done at the university of new south wales uh where what they discovered there was in, in some research was that people are very good at, at um, reading. Give people something to read, they can read it very well. And they're also very good at listening. But guess what people can't do simultaneously? About the same time. <laughs> read and listen, okay. But, you know, if you're reading a book or something, or you're in a cafe reading the paper and someone comes to talk to you, you look up, don't you? You, you, yeah. can't, you, you can't read and still... Um, and yet that's what we often ask people to do in a presentation. So we put the bullet points up while people are reading them. We're talking over it. Yeah. So instead of that, one of the skills that I, I teach in, in, in my speaking skills is to create some anticipation. So, for example, rather than showing that so people can see it, I might say something like build up the interest. So I might say something like I'm going to show you a graph in a moment. Now, this is all about our profitability over 2021. Some interesting things on it. I've marked with an X. But the bit I want you to look at is a part that I've drawn a red circle around. So just have a look at that, and I'll explain it in a moment. Yeah. OK, now we've got everybody looking at the red circle. We've also created some suspense and interest before we showed it, a little bit of a story. So sometimes it's not necessarily the slides are no good. It's the way we introduce them that that would make a difference. Yeah. It's all these things, <laughs> PowerPoint, flip charts, the internet, email, all these things that, that they all get criticised, but it's yeah. actually the way that we use them. It's not the thing itself. And you could still do it, but one of my big tips in, in presenting it on um, in Zoom, I mean, I, over the last year, I've done one training where I've actually gone out. That was recently. But apart from that, all my training and talks were on Zoom. And, um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, people find... People often find that challenging, but you know, here I am with a flip chart here. You could be, incidentally, when people are speaking on Zoom, I, I recommend standing up um, if you've got a presentation to do, because we get more energy when we stand mm -hmm. than when we sit, um, and it'll have more impact. Also, you know, don't be afraid to use something like a flip chart like I'm doing here. I could talk to my team here. I could be drawing something. I could ask them for contributions. I could write it up just like we do if we're in a room, providing you get the camera adjusted so it's close enough up. Yeah. So you can see that. Um, so there's quite a lot we can do. And also your listeners and viewers would be familiar with, I guess, certain software such as Miro, M-I-R-O, Miro, and yeah. Jamboard. These are, people can look them up, Miro and Jamboard. These are things where we can interact with, with virtual post-it notes, have people in breakout rooms, um, you know, you can even have an iPad. Um, people can even draw on, on these things as well. So mm -hmm. that's right. Um, I could have an I, I can share my I could have an iPad connected with the um, with a computer and sketch on it, which I sometimes do. Share the screen to share a sketch. Or, but I prefer to do it up on the, the flip chart. So. Yeah, uh, I think there's clues there that this, these are the ways that we like to to get the message coming across because there are so many more. I see corporate presentations that use handwriting like fonts um, that, that, that draw, uh, that have drawing style graphics rather yes. than some straight edge graphics. So, yes. so much more of the corporate presentations I see, yeah. whilst they're not hand drawn and handwritten, they start to look that. So, we, I, think, yeah. I think we're getting the message across here that, that you know, people are engaged by this way of doing it. What better way than just to take the extra step and actually make it? hand yeah. drawn on occasion i mean it it gets me back to where i remember and i'm talking about the first job i ever i ever first proper job i should say ever had and there was four of us went into a, a meeting room and three of us were going to get jobs as trainers in the nhs uh, and i remember two of us um came in with the old printed acetates to do our presentation that we talked about earlier on. Yeah. Um, a third person came in with a floppy disk. And this is aging it now, a little uh, floppy disk ready to with all the exercises on. And the fourth person just came in with their bike helmet and a pen. And I went, oh, what, the, what the heck is this person doing? <laughs> what a loony, what are you doing, man? Um, um, and you'd probably think he was the one that probably didn't get it. Well, the person that didn't get it was the person with the floppy disk. 
Um, because as soon as you put it in the machine, it, like he's trying, trying to put a virus across the system. But that aside, <laughs> um, he actually was really engaging because that's what he did. He got the pen, he went to the flip chart, and he drew his idea, he drew yeah. his presentation as he was talking. Yes. And, and lots of people, I don't know where, I mean, it's interesting you take on this as to why people don't do that. Is it? Is it a little bit? And I guess this spans both of your books, actually. Is it the the limiting belief of the drawing? Is it the limiting belief of I can't speak or present? Is it the desire not to? What's what's driving these things? I I, I think it could be a number of things. I, I think it, there is the I can't draw thing. Um, therefore, a number of people don't. There is what we're used to. So presenting, but some people believe that if, if, if people talk about doing a presentation, there, there is quite a belief that that has to be a PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, people even talk about borrowing, you know, can I borrow your presentation? So they'll give you a memory stick as though that is the presentation. But of course, the presentation is really you and the, the PowerPoint should be in support. Um, so I think one of the things that stops people doing a sketch or drawing is they perhaps haven't had experience of it. They may not even have occurred to them. Uh, sometimes it might seem like it's not as professional mm -hmm. as having, um, uh, you know, a, a PowerPoint thing. But having said that, um, so I think it's it's those sorts of things. But once you can get people into it, it's a little bit like, um, um, you know, if you had a team uh, in those days where you could have facilitation boards in a room, and hopefully we'll be back in proper rooms uh, these days soon, um, where you get people sketching. Um, their ideas um, or, or putting ideas on a board. You could have, you know, 16 people in four groups of four up on a, a board and you could ask them just to put their ideas up and draw a symbol mm -hmm. for each one or draw a metaphor. You know, let's let's draw a metaphor for our, uh, our organisation or for our team. Somebody might draw a spider's web, you know, a group. Another group might draw a garden, mm -hmm. okay? But the point is... It, the drawings don't have to be great, but once you begin to explore the metaphor, you know, people um, uh, start to expand it because metaphors are so rich in information. Mm. So people might draw a garden and then the other people are going, well, if that's the garden, then I, you haven't put any weeds on there. I think we've got a few weeds. You know, <laughs> people start to talk metaphorically. Yeah. Um, oh, I think, I think you know, we, we need a few tools in the garden or whatever. So, um so, yeah, I think probably it's 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 people's lack of belief that they could do it, lack of practice at doing it. Um, but you know, you can get tips apart from the books that I've written. Um, there's um, a wonderful um, lady called Sylvia Duckworth who's written a book called Sketch Noting or something like that. Where if you put Sylvia Duckworth and Sketch Noting into um, uh, Amazon or Google, you'll find her. And she maintains that using simple symbols like this, we can explain. You know, even if you've only got 100 symbols, we can explain lots of different concepts. Mm. And, um, they're all really easy ones to do. Definitely. So, well, I yeah. actually shared a story with you that when we chatted the other day, which was around, um, it, it was in my early training days again. And um, I was training people that had never used a PC. And and the power of the description of symbols actually actually was really important to them because I was stood there going right what we need to do now let's explore it we're going to look at this is the USB socket <laughs> and I the what the the what the US what the USB and you kind of and the and the trick and the trap that people fall in they start explaining USB and they start explaining the symbol that there's a little line it's like a little networky bit and all this sort of stuff. And there was, a, there was a lady in the group and she actually turned around and she said, oh, the one there that looks like a, a cactus on its side. Yeah. And I went, that's genius. Yeah. And I, and I'm having that because then after that, who can look at the front of the, the computer and find yeah. a, a cactus on its side? Everyone Absolutely. got it first time, every time. Yeah. Yeah. Another one was the uh, the PowerPoint presentation. So in PowerPoint, the little symbol in the bottom right-hand corner that you press to start the slideshow, that's actually one of those little draw the little uh, display boards that you draw down on the string um again one of the ladies in the group went you mean the one that looks like a wine glass brilliant i'm <laughs> having it i'm using it it's exactly that that just sort of explaining it in symbols yeah you mentioned well you mentioned confidence so you've mentioned confidence a few times and i go while you were talking before you you actually made me think that are people more likely to start drawing these ideas and sketching when groups are smaller, because I see in one-to-ones and coaching sessions and even just meetings of three or four people, yeah. quite often we do sketch something. Down. Yeah. 
But then yeah. when there's 50 people or 15 people even, we don't. Yeah, I think that's right, um, Rob. And, and I mean, often people, if they're meeting just one to one, might might sketch something on a bit of paper. You know, you might be doing a coaching session or just chatting with someone. So it, it's a bit like this, you know. Mm. Um, and and I think there's it's kind of more high risk if you've got a bigger group um, in many people's minds. And, and you do have to be prepared um, if you're going if you're going to present something, and you're purposely like use a metaphor for something. I'll give you an example in a moment. Um, and you're going to explain it to a group, you do have to be prepared. It's a bit like a comedian who just looks like they're spontaneous. Um, <laughs> it looks spontaneous, but it isn't. Yeah. Um, you know, they perhaps can be spontaneous as well, you know, like improvisation, people are spontaneous, okay, but typically they've got a script. And it's a bit like drawing. If you're going to explain a model or a concept, a leadership model, you need to think it out. You know, you can't just draw it straight on the fly yeah. on off, off, off the top of your head. You might be able to, but it's better if you've thought it through. Mm. Um, so I think people getting a little bit of practice first is good. But actually, and, and the other thing is, um, I think people seeing examples. So that's why these sorts of examples that I've been showing you here, oh, well, here's another example here. Once people can see, can you see the one at the bottom that's a bit like a journey? Can you see yeah, that? Yeah, like a road going up the centre and it's kind of a start and an end. That's right. You know, once people can see that, oh, is that is that what you mean? You could do, Most people could draw something like that. Mm. For those listening, I've got a, a journey with a start and a finish and I've got a bridge with people going over the bridge and I've got a, a globe for network. Um, or it could be a cycle, this little cycle at the top, like a research cycle. Again, those listening, I've got the word cycle in the centre and four... Um, oval shapes around it connected by arrows so we've got a process so you know actions we've got a little man running or a little lady running um, research we've got a little um, test got, it test tube type thing um, so you know once people can see they're fairly simple then they could do it and, and, and that's that's the reason why um, it's good to see examples so um, that's why like Sylvia Duckworth's book for example has got loads of examples in it um, um, for using visuals in meetings, there's a chap called David Sibbett. That's a really good book, S-I-B-B-E-T. He's written a book called Visual Meetings, packed with examples of how you can sketch things. Um, and then in my book, The Art of Business Communication, it's got lots of examples. And once, once you can see an example, you think, oh yeah, I could do that. I could apply that to my own situation. Mm -hmm. But in the absence of an example, if I said I would go and use sketching, you think, oh, I don't know where to start. Yeah. Well, just to so, give you a great example of that, I mean, I mentioned at the start of this episode around how much I love my TED Talks. Yeah. And um, one of my other favourite TED Talks, it's up there at the top, is Simon Sinek. Um, yes. And he talks about his golden circle. And sure enough, he doesn't have a PowerPoint in the background that's building up a circle. He's got a flip chart and he's got a pen and he just literally draws three yes. circles and yes. three words and and, yeah. and for me that was so easy to remember and i think another thing is that you know nowadays as we are you just grab your phone you take a picture of it and you've got it and it me you can you can recollect it you understand yeah. it yeah well and that's exactly the example is with simon cynics that's a great example rob because he's he's drawing these circles and it's anybody could do that and they're just words on there when he writes them but the point is it's very powerful because he can control what you're seeing with the words that he's speaking. He's controlling when he's writing it and when he's drawing it. And it's very memorable. You can picture it. I can picture it now. Yeah. If you wanted to publish it in a book or send it out on a proper thing, you know, he could do get a nice diagram of it, like in PowerPoint or something. You know, he, he may not put that exact drawing in the book. But the fact is that when you've seen him draw it, it's very memorable. And again, in training, mm -hmm. Or when I'm training people here, I might draw something, okay, and then I'll photograph it afterwards and stick it on a, in a Google album and send a link to it. Mm. When people see it the way you drew it, then they can remember it. 100%. Uh, and yeah. quite often when you do see his printed resources in his books or, or on the presentations, it's quite often in a drawn font. It might not be the exact one he drew. That's right. It could be a replication of it, but it's never a neat circle. It's, no. it's nearly always a, a no. drawn, no. the ends don't meet circle. <laughs> That's right, exactly. I was just thinking of a, a little example for you. Um, just grabbing another pen here. Because thinking of managers and leaders and how you explain things, um, metaphors are very powerful explaining for explaining. Mm. And some people watching and listening may have come across this metaphor um, for giving feedback. Because obviously, when you're managing people, we want to give and receive feedback. So one 
quick little sketch that I've often used for that is, is which people may be familiar with, is um, that of a rocket to the moon. Mm -hmm. Okay. So giving feedback is a bit like sending a rocket to the moon. So if, for example, we've got the moon up here, I'm just drawing, for those who are just listening, I'm drawing a, a semicircle in the top right-hand corner of the flip chart with some craters on it to represent the moon, the moon up here. Then down here, I've got the Earth, okay? And on the Earth, we've got, uh, we've got Houston here, a uh, little building here with a, uh, I'm just doing a little building with a aerial on the top to represent uh, Houston on Earth here. And then you might be saying to your, to your, uh, your team, advising people about giving feedback, say it's a bit like this. And of course, as you're drawing it, people are hooked because they're all watching it. So I'm drawing a little rocket here. Those uh, listening, a bit like Tintin's rocket. You can even put a bit of um, bit of colour on it. There we are. Yeah, I'm getting flashbacks to my youth and thinking of Button Moon now. And that's it. <laughs> so I've got a little rocket just taking off. And the thing is, if you think about a rocket, when they launch it, I'm going to draw a little arrow with it going along there. If you can see this little arrow, can you? Yeah. Little arrows, okay. But the point is, it looks like it's going straight, but actually any rocket going to the moon or any other planet, it doesn't always go dead straight. It, it moves very slightly. And of course, what are they doing all the time? They're getting feedback from the rocket all the time. And every time it's sort of moving fractionally or even a fraction off course, they're correcting it. But as you can see from me drawing these little arrows, the corrections are so infinitesimally small that you'd never notice them. Mm. Okay, now think about this. What would happen if the first time this rocket went a fraction off course, a fraction off course, let's say they didn't correct it, mm. where would it end up? So now for those listening, not watching, I'm drawing a line swerving over to the right, missing the moon by miles. Yeah, it's swerving <laughs> off towards Saturn now. It's swerving off towards Saturn. <laughs> so now we've got this huge gap here. We've got a huge gap in, in the result we wanted. We wanted the because we didn't make small corrections as we went along. So likewise, as leaders and managers managing a team, um, you know, what's important is not to wait until the end of the year when it's appraisal time to give a, that important piece of feedback, because by that time, the performance is way off target. Mm. Much, much easier to give people a little tip or a little suggestion as we go along, little bits of tiny feedback before people are way off track. Mm. So that's an example, Rob, of... of Thinking of a metaphor uh, for something we want to explain mm. and coming up with a little picture to, to explain that metaphor that would stay in the memory. I think it's fantastic. It's a mindset piece again. You know, all the people listening and watching this, as a leader, it's, it must be much, much better and much more rewarding to, to coach people on that first joint journey with the little arrows that you're talking about there to be able to go, I want to help you get to the moon basically, yeah. uh, rather than wait six months or 12 months and then we'll have a big discussion about where it all went wrong and why you've ended up on Saturn. Absolutely. Um, no, no one wants those. And I think this <laughs> is a, and this is, I, mean, I get a beam about it about this next word or these next words, I should say, these difficult conversations pieces. Yes. Uh, and I always say, you know, if you practice having great conversations, and I guess if I, if I put on top of that, um, a sharing great communication, as you're talking yes. about now, the number of what you think are difficult conversations will probably fall away because by doing what you're doing, we're never going to have that conversation about how you veered way off course and are now hitting no. Saturn no. because we've, we've, we've talked about it and we've got you towards your goal. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, Rob. Yeah. And, and, and the thing is drawing the, this simple little drawing, which you could do on a piece of a four paper, which is one other person or in a, in a, a room with a group. The point is it doesn't have to be very clever. If you really look at it, anybody could draw this. Anyone could draw this. Okay. But it's kind of having the idea. Yeah. Um, so, um, but the point is, it doesn't have to be a fantastic drawing, but it will stay in the memory. And people will, will remember, oh, remember that time our manager drew that rocket and things? That, that is now imprinted in the mind. And anybody who doubted the power of pictures to stay in the memory, um, again, I, I've, I've quote various research, such as um, in uh, way back, there was a gentleman called Ralph Haber, who did an experiment where he showed people 2,560 pictures, okay, at 10 second intervals. So it took a long time with breaks in between. Subsequently, what he did, Rob, was he showed people two pictures at a time, two slides, and he asked people, which of these have you seen before? Because he showed them one they'd seen before and one they hadn't. Mm -hmm. okay. And 
they had to say, I've seen that one, but I haven't seen that one, and guess. Um, on average, their aver his average results were between 85 and 90 95% of people accurately saying which picture they'd seen. And just cutting to the point, really, um, there was a chap called Ray Nickerson who did a, a, an even bigger experiment that built on that. And um, what, what he demonstrated it, it, by showing 600 pictures, but eventually 10,000 pictures, mm -hmm. 10,000 pictures. But he made them really striking pictures, vivid pictures that people might remember. He got results of around 98, 99% consistently when he decided to use striking pictures. So it's good news for those mm. using PowerPoint is that if you make it predominantly pictures and graphic pictures mainly, people remember that more than all of the words. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so you know, so and this is another reason why this and drawing it live gives it another dimension. But even if you're not drawing it live, if you had a rocket to the moon on a on a a PowerPoint picture, you'd still get your message across. But yeah. this just enables you to be a little bit more clever in the way that you're explaining it. Uh, I think I think what's really important as well for me, just observing what you've drawn there, is that the fact that you've actually written the word earth on earth and you've written the word moon on moon hasn't taken away from the fact that it's still a drawing. It's still a visual that I'm going to remember. So you don't, you know, you don't have to be the world's greatest <laughs> artist and start making it the most, the yeah. best drawing of a moon ever no. start getting the watercolors no. out or whatever it might be. It yeah. is just the story that you're telling with it. Well, that's a great, great point. I got a tip at the risk of a name drop because it is a name drop for those who, who know of um, uh, Tony Buzan, who, um, who, who sadly uh, it passed away some time ago, but who was the, the originator of the term mind map. Mm -hmm. um, he, he actually said to me once, because I spoke at a conference that he happened to be speaking at, and he gave me a tip about doing mind maps. And he said, if you do the picture close to the word, proximity is important. And it's spot on. Although a picture um, says a thousand words, um, Rob, it wasn't lost on you that I'd written the word earth and I'd written the mm -hmm. word moon. And again, you know, if you've got people developing ideas in a room on a whiteboard and you wanted them to write the words, do, do a picture next to it, but do both. You know, don't just draw the picture, put the word next to it. And also, if you're not particularly good at drawing, it leaves nobody in any doubt <laughs> as to what you've drawn. That one's Earth and that one's the moon, no exactly. matter what you think. That's, I, yeah. I, mean, I think that's a fantastic tip. And, you know, that's that's another way now I will be describing uh, how uh, the the uh, urgency of feedback is yeah. an important thing. Give it in so a my, timely my, manner. That's it. So my tip to people would be have a go and don't wait for some dramatic time to do it. You know, you could, you might be just explaining something to a colleague and say, mm. well, you know, it looks a bit like this, this graph. Let me just draw it on a bit of paper for you or... It might be a team meeting and you say, well, let me let, I'm just going to draw a pie chart here and, and, and write it on or get people to mm. guess or whatever it is. Um, you know, if you're again back at work, if you're able to draw a visions, you know, you might get a big piece of paper, or a big whiteboard in the room and get people to give them the colored pens and get them to sketch it. Mm. Um, one of the tips that, that I would give is you have to overcome that belief of people having a go. Mm. And a, a shortcut that you could do that I know lots of people have used done were well, two tips, really. One, quite often I know people have got the, their team to draw Spike, my character that um, uh, is on the TEDx Hull talk. Yeah. And just getting them to do that, you could teach them to draw that just by watching that little talk. And then they go, oh, wow, that's not bad. And the second thing is, if you're a little bit assertive with people and just say, look, there's only one rule here. When you're drawing this vision or when you're writing your ideas, if you write a word or a phrase, you must draw a symbol doesn't matter how rubbish it is you must draw it and what you'll find is people will have a go yeah. once you give them that rule okay. yeah no absolutely i can imagine that they do and you know I think this is a great opportunity as well as people are coming back together into the office you could actually use that with the team exercise things like um i want everyone to draw how they feel about coming back into the office yeah or, or draw how the first week's been or draw what yeah. lockdown's been like or whatever it might be uh, and like you say some people might be as simple as smiley face or unhappy face yeah. other people might start getting a little bit more elaborate in the drawings it. but i think you're right then the, the the lengths then the metaphors start to grow and it's a fantastic activity yeah no it's great and and it also overcomes people's belief that they they can't draw you know if you just get them to to, to draw a spike or something like that so and i think that's a anyway. great coaching conversation then to kind of go well <laughs> yeah. wow now you've done that what else don't you think you could do that's right that, that you think you could overcome 
Well, that's right. Because I, I mean, I get asked to do, um, we've been online in the last year, conference speech, speeches and that sort of thing, or speeches is the wrong word, really, talks. But I do activities where I get them to draw. And sometimes it's to help them to explain things. But other times they say, no, we just want you to get them to draw so they can realize they can do things they didn't think they could previously do. So I get, you know, a number of Brilliant. people ask me to do that. Rubik's Cube. Cube. There we go. There you go. So if you want yeah, to do, anyway. you want to start drawing, get Graham in. If you want to do I, Rubik's Cube as well, we can we can come together. Yeah, well, I need to learn to do this cube, Rob, so you have to give me some tips. <laughs> anyway, okay, brilliant. brilliant stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, we come to the part of the show where um, I like to just kind of look back at what we've been talking about, Graham, which is, uh, well, every single bit of it I've absolutely loved, and come up with a title for this episode of the show um, based on that. Because I always like to do it that way around. Rather than giving a title, then I've, everything's got to try and aim back towards it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like it to all grow and see where we've uh, see where we get to. Have you got any ideas based on what the way the conversation's gone today? <laughs> what this episode could be called? Well, I don't know. It could be. I mean, I, actually, this this flip chart that I had up happens to be this cover one happens to be the last little workshop I did, which was about a ninety minute workshop on um, making information memorable. Um, so that's one option is making information memorable, uh, how to engage people, um, uh, how to engage an audience, um, how, how to, how to, how to get your message across. Um, uh, it, we, we talked a lot about pictures, so it could be, you know, how, how to get your idea across with a sketch, um, uh, yeah. I'll tell, tell, tell you what I thought right at the end as well. I'm not saying this is what we're going to call it, but when you're drawing the rocket, I was thinking, Houston, we have a communication problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or a feedback problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Something like that, yeah. So I think it needs to be something about making information memorable, making ideas yeah. memorable. Um, and, I like and, the idea of making information mem- memorable. Really well, you can it. apply it to presenting. If you're presenting as a leader, you want to make your information memorable, either through the way that you're speaking, how you're standing your voice, or or perhaps through pictures on PowerPoint or on, on um, a sketch. Um, and also, you might be wanting to use it for studying. So if, if for example, you're studying, it's great to do mind maps. It's great to do, um, uh, even if it's a list of words, little mm. sketches and things. Um, so... Um, yeah, so something like that, Mike. I like that. making information memorable, and I think you know one of the one of the best things I would encourage everyone to walk away with today, or a challenge to set to them to walk away with today, <laughs> I should say, is something that we talked about um, um, when we chatted. Um, is so often we see lists of values, company values on a wall in an organization. What I'd love for people to go away and do is draw draw something for each one of those values because so often i'll say to people I'll say to leaders in organizations what are the values and they'll say hang on a second i'll just look them up on the internet yeah. they're not, obviously not memorable for whatever reason well you know we won't go into that right now that's another, yeah. that's another episode um but if you could if you could do them as, as drawings and sketches yeah. or icons yeah. and things like that attached to simpler words yes how much more memorable could they be Absolutely. I actually did some work with an uh, electronics company some years ago where they had, it was about seven or eight values. And as part of the activity, I taught them a little bit of drawing. But then later in the afternoon, they had a board each and they each group had to take one of the values and they had to write the value in the middle and draw a symbol of it. And then around the edge, a bit like a mind map, they had to draw, um, they had to bring it to life. So what would that value be like in practice? What are the behaviours that, that, that would be evidence that that value is happening. Yeah. And they, 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 with the pens, they drew them on the boards and then they had to show the boards to the others. So, you know, there's an activity building on what you've suggested, Rob. Love it. Oh, yeah. It's exactly, I, I describe what you've just said there about what are the behaviours I'll see. I love that as, a, as an exercise because I also spin it around sometimes, say, of your existing ones, what are the behaviours that you do see that prove this doesn't exist? And then oh, and sometimes that, that, gets the, that gets the juices flowing sometimes. That's a, that's a great way of putting it, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway. The opposite sometimes. Brilliant yeah. stuff. Um, I'm going to put uh, a bunch of links, obviously, uh, in the show notes for people to take a look at. Uh, and I've, I've actually got a, a page on the website that I'll pull together as well, just with links to the to the videos, the, the TED Talks and the books and so on. Uh, but, you know, for them, what, what is the, the best way to kind of follow you or, or keep in touch with what you're doing? Um, well, uh, the website, um, which is um, grahamshaw.co.uk, um, there's always information on there. Um, but you, people, people can find me on um, uh, LinkedIn, 
I'm on there and uh, and Twitter. I don't post all the time, but uh, and on Facebook, I've got a Facebook Art of Communication page. And also, if, if they put my name into YouTube, you'll find actually that's the point. You'll find various videos on there yeah. that you can. If you've got uh, endless hours to spend drawing, there's lots of little drawing videos and, and tips on there too. So uh, yeah, Activ- and the activities along with the summer holidays around the corner as well. Just uh, that's sit, right. Sit the kids in front of some of your videos. Get them to learn. To yeah, them. yeah. So uh, people are welcome to have a look at that, and uh, all the information about how to contact me is on the website as well. So yeah. Great. And you very kindly uh, shared with me an exercise sheet, which I'm just showing on the screen as well for the YouTube guys. Um, that's going to be available on the um, the web page as well. Uh, also, I will put links, as you can see in the background, just get your books. Um, I'll put links to both of Graham's books there, The Art of Business Communication and The Speaker's Coach. Uh, so please take a look at those. Um, they cover a lot of the a lot of the things we've been talking about today, really. One around, obviously, getting, the, getting it across visually, but also then the other things around leadership and body language and actually being able to get that message across, supporting that. Uh, so please take a look at those. Um, and before we go, well, after after the, the the close of the episode properly now, um, what we're going to do is come back uh, for ten minutes, uh, just uh, exclusively on the the YouTube channel, uh, for those listening on there and watching on there, and we're going to do a, a quick drawing. So I'm going to draw live with Graham uh, to try and follow his instructions because I'm one of those I can't draw, and we're going to see how that goes. Um, so. For the uh, for the podcast audience, Graham, I thank you so much for today. I've, I've really enjoyed it, uh, and I genuinely mean that. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on, and I've, I've loved just a different way of thinking about getting uh, getting that information across. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for asking me along, Rob, and thank you those people for watching and listening. And um, hopefully, if you get to look at the um, uh, YouTube thing we're about to do, uh, you can grab a pen and uh, join in with that. Absolutely, do that, and then uh, and then email them to us, and we'll make a big collage <laughs> and send them over to Graham. There's a bunch. Brilliant. That'd be, that'd be a treat. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you so much, Graham. I'll speak to you. In a minute. Pleasure, pleasure, Rob. Thank you. Fair enough. And that brings us to the end of this episode of the Leadership Untitled podcast. This episode will be called Making Information Memorable. Thanks to the tips and different styles of communication with drawing that Graham has shared with us today. All that remains is to thank Graham again for joining me today and sharing all his hints and tips, but also you, the listener, for listening to him. Please subscribe and follow the podcast so you don't miss future episodes and on YouTube as well. And if you'd like to get in touch, please do so via rob at robmores.com or look at the website of the same name. Follow me on LinkedIn as well for daily updates and hints and tips also. I'll have a great day and I'll speak to you soon. Bye now. Hey guys, so, so welcome back. Um, so this is just the, the, the bonus element for those of you that are watching on YouTube or if you've switched over from the podcast to, to come and take a look. So Graham's kindly uh, agreed to just hang around for a moment and uh, basically take us on that kind of journey of thinking that we can't draw to hopefully in around 10 minutes time was able to go away and, and say to people in our family, look what I've done, I can draw. Uh, <laughs> unlock a bit of a mindset for trying stuff out and then... <laughs> Another one will be that at another time. But anyway, oh, that's wow, yeah. Let's stick to the drawings. <laughs> That'd be the one to learn the Rubik's Cube. Okay. All right. So, well, uh, thank you for joining us, uh, those of you watching and uh, right now. So what this is all about is just getting you started a little bit with, with a bit of drawing. Um, it's a bit like, um, you know, when uh, I, I've seen these uh, gliders that are taken up by uh, into the air by a Land Rover, you know, or a vehicle pulling a glider, and it gets it up in the air, and when it gets up, it, it pulls the tow rope off and then the glider goes on its own, you know. So I feel that what I'm trying to do is kind of just get you going, really, so you can carry on practising. And uh, um, uh, Yeah, so you carry on. So once you get the idea of this, you'll be able to practise more. And um, I think Rob's also put a, um, a, a, a worksheet, haven't you, that I've... That's, that's going to be somewhere that you're going to put so um absolutely that. that'll be on the on the link to the uh, on my web page so i'll have that i'll have your profile links to your yeah. videos and the sheet so uh, this is just the start of everyone's journey so so this is yeah so 
the, the main thing that you need in order to be successful at this, you don't need any pre previous experience at drawing. You just need to have an open mind and, uh, and be prepared to have a go at it. And that's, that'll do. So the first thing, I'd like you to just watch me first. I'm just going to do one drawing. OK, so just watch. So I'm drawing my uh, this character that I made up that somebody called him Spike. Uh, I didn't actually uh, name him Spike, but somebody saw me doing him and uh, said, I think you should be called Spike. So there he is. All right. So that's Spike. So that's going to be our first cartoon. And the way we're going to do it is I'll draw the first line and then you draw the line and then then just look up and uh, and be ready for the next line. OK, so grab a pen and paper or tablet or whatever you're drawing on. So let's start with. There we are, the nose. The nose. Now we're going to do the eyes and they're going to look a bit like 66s. Or some people say they look a bit like speech marks. Okay. Oh, brilliant, Rob. Okay, I can see that. And a nice big smile under the nose there. And now, put, if you put your pen above the nose and come over this way, and we'll do an ear like that. Okay. Kind of have a guess as to how far away the ear is, that's it. Then put the pen above the eyes and we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six bits of spiky hair. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, Rob, pen to the left of the mouth and we come down like that. That's it. Now, put the pen just under the ear, drop a line down. And now put the pen to the left of the T-shirt and we'll go round like that. And we'll go line to the left, line to the right. Wow, there we are. Fantastic, Rob. Well, that looks pretty impressive to me. <laughs> yeah, we've got Spike. <laughs> we've got Spike. So if, if everyone, if we're all live now, you could all hold your drawings up so that we could see them. So now, the important thing about this is, and I think Rob's spike looks fantastic there. So the important thing about this is it looks like we've learned to draw just one picture, but actually you've learned a little sequence that would enable you to draw hundreds and thousands of pictures. Because if you look at the pictures that I've got on this sheet here, what you can see is in a way, if you look closely, there are variations on Spike in the sense that, you know, it's the same sort of idea. Sometimes we change the eyes a bit, sometimes change the mouth a bit, that sort of thing. And if we look on the next page I'm going to show you, we can see more, but with colour. All right. So yeah. by doing variations, we can do actually rather a lot of different pictures. And also, just as a little aside, if you're interested in... Those of you who really want to get into this, if you're interested in drawing different skin tones, you can see these grey tones there, yep. um, or these coloured tones here. They look like I've um, sprayed them on, but actually they're using, um, oh, there's some more, there's some more there's a grey, faces from the front. Um, but if you look at these, it looks like it's sprayed on there, doesn't it? If you look again over here, they look like they've been sprayed. Okay, a little tip. Um, there are some pens that I use when I want to do skin tones called Pro Markers. Um, I'm not a representative or a salesperson for it, but they're made by a company called Letraset and also by Winsor & Newton, it, it's got on some of these. And what's lovely about those is when you shade in with those, they, 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 it looks like that it's been sprayed on. Um, so they're, they're just quite nice to use. So let's now, just do little variations to create some different characters. Okay, so, you ready, Rob? I'm ready. Okay, so we're gonna start again with a nose, but this time we're gonna do um, a different nose. So we go nose. Okay, uh, we'll go eyes. 
like that. Now, where the mouth is, we might have a different mouth. So we might want to do an expression like shocked, which would be, what would shocked be like? <gasps> Open mouth, that's it, a very good one. <laughs> okay, so just draw, just draw shocked there, like that. That's it. So we've got nose, eyes, mouth again, same sequence, because if we do the same sequence, the learning gets into the muscle. And then we're going to do some hair like this. A bit like my mum's hair. <laughs> That's it. And we put a line to the left, start to the left of the mouth there. And we go yeah. like that. And we go under the hair. So it, we can't see the ear. So we just come back from there. Uh, we could do a bit of jewellery on there if we wanted. Little V-shape, line to the left, line to the right. And the sort of thing you can practice, I'm just reaching for a, a colour here. Uh, when you're doing your drawings, you can use colours to shade in. Those people are, if you're interested in doing drawings to help people remember things, if we use colours, that works really well. But, you know, a little bit of colour or just shading with the same colour, that'll do. Well, we'll, have to, we'll have to have a red there, there, Graham. There we are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so you soon start to see, oh, fantastic, Rob. So you seem to start to see how you can get different colors. So let's draw a couple more characters. Notice what we're gonna do is vary things each time. So that time we varied the, the mouth, we varied the hair. Let's do another one. Okay, this time, uh, let's draw um, somebody that you would recognize. So here we go, we'll draw nose. Next, we'll do the eyes. So we'll do 66s again for the eyes. Now we're gonna draw Albert Einstein. So if we think about it, what makes Einstein look like Einstein? One of the things that stands out is what, Rob? Yep, the moustache. <laughs> crazy hair. The moustache and crazy. So draw the moustache like that. There was a golfer called Craig Stadler years ago, and uh, uh, Rob's nodding. Do you remember what they used to call him? The walrus. <laughs> the walrus, yeah. He had a moustache like that. Right, so next we're going to do the hair. Now, for Einstein, hair all over the place would be suitable. So just go with anything that looks a bit like this. That's it. Lots of squiggles, Rob. That's it. A little line down here for just coming under the chin there. A little line down at the back. And we'll just put a, give him a t-shirt. I don't know if Einstein wore a t-shirt or not, but there he is. Excellent. You got your picture of Einstein. Okay, should we do a couple more, Rob? Well, yeah, I'm enjoying yeah, it. A couple, couple more, okay. So here we go. So, oh, here's a, is is a nice uh, is a nice little uh, character here. What we'll do is we'll do we'll do another nose like that. Yep. And uh, this time we'll do some different eyes. Watch. I'm going to draw two eyes together like that. So we've varied the eyes this time. And we'll have him looking up. We'll draw this a. Uh, uh, boy here looking up. Okay, so nose, eyes, mouth. Now for the mouth, if you blink, you're going to miss this. So watch carefully. Ready? I can do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll make that a bit bigger so viewers can see it. A little dot means he's sort of thinking or looking up. We'll draw the ear over there. And we'll put put the uh, put a line across there, and then we'll go like that. Got a cap, and we'll go like that. The same sort of idea. 
And you know where we're going next. We're going to put the pen below the ear and come down like that. V shape, line to the left, line to the right. What name would you give this character, uh, Rob? Uh, Andy, Andy, Andy Cap. Andy Cap. Okay, so we'll call him Andy. <laughs> There we are. We didn't actually we didn't actually name this lady before. What what name would you give this lady, uh, Rob? Well, you said you've got hair like your mum. So what's your mum's name? Mary. There you go, Mary. It is. That's Mary. Okay. So should we do? Should we just do one more? One more. Yes. Let's go. Okay. Get, so now now we'll, now we'll do um we'll, we'll we'll do a different one where we've got got a face more from the the front view. Uh, so. What we'll do is, I'll show you the whole thing we're going to draw first. We're going to go like, don't draw it yet. We're going to do this. Just watch. Okay, I'm going to draw that little character looking up. So ready? So we'll start with the nose. So this time the nose is going up like that. Sometimes people like to put two little dots in here under the nose. <laughs> the nostrils. <laughs> that's, that's, that's optional, but yeah. So then we go down like that and like that. Then we do the ears. So we want one ear sticking out here. You can make them stick out like funny ears. Then we go like that. Then we can go like this, watch, down like that, and down like that. Yep, two little lines down there. Top of the T-shirt. Then, big smile like that. We could even do that. And then draw a straight line across like that. And then shade in everything that's below that line. There we go. Okay. And um, we'll just finish it off with this. Look, we'll do some little arms here. Just we'll make, make it a big head and little arms. And we'll do little arms out there like that. Little arm the other side, rather. Just watching what Rob's doing here. Right, and then some hands will go like that. This sort of thumb and a few fingers sticking out there. Yep, that's like the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right. And then we could go like that and like that. And if we really feel clever, we could do some some of those juggling balls. You know, those they're kind of made in leather, aren't they? Filled with sand. And then, if you've got time, uh, <laughs> you got nothing. Um, you got nothing better. To, you got nothing better to do with your time. You can you can later on. You can have a bit of a bit of a coloring in, coloring some of the balls. You know, they're these sorts of things, aren't they? That. I won't do them all. I've got them somewhere, yeah. You know, these sorts of juggling balls you can get that are all different, uh, all different colours. There we are. Like it. I won't colour them all in, but there we are. So we've got we've got a, a character doing a bit of um character doing a bit of juggling there. And we can put a fit, few little lines on there to make it look like the balls are moving. So a bit of motion going on. A bit of motion going on, yeah. So <laughs> so there we've got. We've got some lessons to get you to get you started in um, in drawing. So have a practice at that. And in fact, one way you can learn is to show someone else how to do it. So um, if you want more practice, that's a great way is to teach somebody else. There we are. Brilliant. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with that as well. Practice <laughs> teaching it to someone. It's one of the best ways of embedding it. Absolutely. Yeah. Love that. Well, you soon once well, you start trying to teach something, Rob, you soon find out what you don't know and which bits are missing. <laughs> well, I can officially say now as well. I'm going to put up here. I can draw. There you go. How about that? That's it. Great stuff. Fantastic. Thank thanks so very much, much, Rob. And thanks everyone for, for tuning in and watching that. I hope you enjoy that. And um, you know, if you want to want more, you can have a look on the, the, the TEDx Hull talk. There's more drawing on there. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And don't forget, we've got the worksheet as well on the link that I'll put onto the show notes. Oh, yes. Um, yes. So I've, just, I've just mislaid my copy of it now, but it's sitting around somewhere. Oh, that's it. That, yeah, will be, that will be yeah. on there. Yeah, that, that worksheet has got lots more. The worksheet's got a lot more, more drawings in that you can practice. All right. So there, 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 there it is. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Terrific. And uh, and uh, anyone who's uh, had a go at this, then please send them through to me on email or send put them on to LinkedIn or put them in the comments, whatever you want to do, get them in touch with me and uh, we'll see if we can pull a few together and, uh, and put them on show. Why not? That'd be great. Right. All right. Thanks for inviting have me, we, Robin. Well, have, we got, have, we got a, have we got a name for this guy before we do? All oh, right. Yeah. What would, what would his name be? Oh, I don't know. Um, uh, I'll go for Jimmy the Juggler. Jimmy the Juggler, there we are, we've got Jimmy the Juggler. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks for inviting me, Rob, and thanks everybody for, for watching this little video. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cheers, Graham. I'll speak Cheers. To you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.